really glad you could join us. Uh, uh, please give a quick introduction uh, about yourself to our audience, and then we'll go from there. Sure. Uh, thanks for having me, first of all. Uh, my name is Douglas Thrawn, and I started out as an aerial cinematographer back in the early 90s, uh, filming out of helicopters and planes. I got a seaplane pilot's license about eight years ago and was filming with GoPros on the side of the seaplane. And no sooner than I got the seaplane license, actually, just the way it worked out, drones came out about a year later. And I saw some footage of a kid flying a drone around in Santa Cruz that they posted on YouTube and the, just the possibilities with the footage was just amazing. So I literally sold my seaplane, got full blown into drones and uh, started shooting more for um, switching from ground cinematography to more aerial cinematography with drones for Nat Geo, Discovery Channel, all the major news networks. And uh, yeah, I haven't looked back since. And um, I just was out. I was, I had actually gotten into, uh, I was filming during the campfires, a guy rescuing cats after the fires. And he at night was using a thermal scope on the ground. And we were talking uh, about how that would be so cool if we could put it on a drone. And then literally about a year later, I was out in the Bahamas after the hurricanes and um, rescuing animals out there. And the debris piles were so bad uh, from like this category five hurricane, the Basically, it, I mean, it demolished thousands of houses and we were having a hard time finding the animals. And I thought back about the infrared cameras and uh, mounted an infrared camera on the drone and it worked exceptionally well. You could find animals uh, hidden amongst the debris piles and it just worked amazingly well. And from the Bahamas, <clears throat> from the Bahamas, I ended up going to Australia rescuing dozens of koalas and then uh, Louisiana rescuing animals after the hurricanes and um, throughout California after the fires and uh, Oregon as well. And yeah, I've just I've pretty much been on the road nonstop for probably about 14 months now. Uh, unbelievable. And, you know, for our audience's uh, understanding, Doug and I got connected through one of Parallel Flight's advisors. And I think, I think Sarah's going to bring up a picture here. Um, and you can see, if you can make that full screen there, um, the, uh, there, there we go. There is some uh, video of the infrared image of, the, of these dogs. Where, where was this taken, Doug? Where's this image from? That was in uh, um, the Abaco Island in uh, uh, Marsh Harbor, uh, part of the Bahamas. And uh, literally, I've, it was just uh, the hurricane was a category five, and it lasted about 40 hours. And it's just, I've never seen anything like it where it just wiped out. I mean, picture like a city like the size of Santa Cruz or something with every house just demolished. It was just unbelievable. Were there other drone pilots out there doing similar work or other work? Or were you the only one? No, I was the only one. And I'm pretty much, um, as far as this, using it for animal rescue and using it with the spotlight and the zoom lens, I pretty much, um, not to toot my own horn, but pretty much pioneered the use of that myself i see and for for animal rescue specifically for animal rescue yes right it um, could be used for people as well and i would hope that that would you know um you know it would be used for people and especially with like the drone that you're building it would be phenomenally good for doing that well and I, I think i think that's one of the really exciting parts about working in the industry that we're working in is that it's really transforming a lot of different uh, aspects of life. You know, search and rescue is, has always been a, a really key aviation application. You know, helicopter pilots are going out there, airplane pilots looking for people, but the ability to get so close to the ground and <clears throat> to have so much control over exactly where you're pointing that camera and that spotlight um, to, to even rescue small animals is, is, is a really a game changer for wildlife conservation, I would imagine. Um, yes. Tell me, like, what's the smallest animal that you could rescue or have rescued? Like, what's, what's your experience there? Well, the smallest one after, after, after the initial rescue on the koalas in um, Australia, uh, it switched to population studies trying to find out what animals were left and I literally I was blown away how 
with the cameras we have already, um, we could find little like pygmy possums that were no bigger than say, probably like a typical, you know, Petco hamster. Um, wow, so something that small climbing on a tree, um, uh, was, um, yeah, it was pretty phenomenal that it could pick that up. Great. It looks like Sarah's p pulling up some video here. Uh, if it's, if you're playing the video, we, we're not seeing it. We're, we're seeing the, uh, it looks like we're having a few technical glitches today. Yeah, that's okay. Um, <clears throat> so what let's, let's talk about, um, first of all, just so the audience understands, uh, parallel flight is working on a number of, of key verticals with our technology. We we're working with firefighting, industrial logistics, healthcare logistics. We're not necessarily, uh, you know, saying, Oh, now we're going to go rescue all these animals. It's our, the, you know, the, the, um, relationship that we're forming with Douglas is exciting because Douglas has so much uh, drone experience flying uh, in, in disaster areas, much like the ones that Parallel Flight is hoping to go into. And we are really excited to have Douglas fly our, our beta aircraft, which is uh, going to be available uh, quite soon. And we'll give some updates about that later in the webinar. Um, but while we're on this topic of, you know, of, of animal rescue, Douglas, what are some of the limitations that you have with the drone technology that's out there right now? The biggest limitation has been uh, the, um, and these are all things that obviously I'm super excited about your drone because yours, you know, basically addresses these problems and, eliminates them um the biggest problem i've had has been the battery life that the battery life you know uh they don't last they don't when you're especially when you're using the spotlight you're lucky to get 20 minutes out of the drone and right. when you're cut, trying to cover large areas it's you know no sooner than you're getting up in the air and you're starting to get out to an area then it seems like you have to bring the drone back right away um other yeah. issues um you know, the battery life, then also, um, you know, with the equipment that they have right now for the infrared, uh, you can't, because of the payload, it can't carry necessarily that much payload. So you have the cameras that are on it um, are limited to digital zoom primarily at night um, right. instead of optical zoom where you could really zoom in and have a spotlight on the animal and you can verify what it was or its condition much easier. Uh, as it is right now, you're having to put a spotlight on and use a zoom that's not really adequate. That's in part of the digital, uh, in part of the infrared camera, and you know sometimes the screen is either blown out and you can't really tell. And then if you try to punch it in from further away because of the light on yeah. the animal, um, it's hard to verify what it is, and you can't really tell sometimes. And in some instances where we were having, you know, it, it made a difference what sort of animals we were finding because we were trying to find scientifically you know what sort of rare animal might be there and it was hard to tell because there's a number of different like glider species and stuff in australia right. and uh so having better optics and then having the ability to carry um you know be able to stay up in the air much longer would uh, definitely help yeah and and when you're doing these this rescue work like how many acres or square miles uh, are you covering in these flights and how much would you like to cover? What, what, um, um, what would be useful there as a, as a number? Oh, I would imagine, I mean, you know, for a place that you like Australia, they're really world wildlife fund who was the one I was doing the studies with, you know, they were wanting to do long-term studies over, you know, five, 10 years. Uh, and they were wanting to cover areas, you know, tens of thousands of acres. Wow. So, um, so the more the the more the merrier. More the merrier. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and what with with the drone, the technology that w that I have right now, compared to what you guys are building, um, you know, yours would run circles around what's out there right now with the DJI drones that I have. So yeah, yours would be far superior to what's out there. And and so you mentioned the Bahamas and Australia. What other countries have you worked in? Uh, as far as the animal rescue, Bahamas, yeah. Bahamas, Australia, um, Puerto Rico, Louisiana, 
uh, all over California and Oregon. The, the nation then, state of California. Yeah. 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 <laughs> California keeps me busy. Yeah. Yeah. And, but so, Australia okay. itself, okay. where the fires were in Australia, I mean, it's, you know, it's kind of until you're there, you don't realize how big, the, like those fires. I mean, it was equivalent to like if we were burning from, you know, tip of Maine all the way down to Miami, Florida. I mean, the area was just, you know, one end of the coast to the other, all up and down. And and t- what is the situation with the koalas down there, and 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 your involvement with rescue? Because uh, mm-hmm. I mean, I think the koala is obviously just such an iconic species, and yeah. um, you know, to, to the, the thought that these animals are endangered um, by these fires is just so so sickening. Um, yeah. Oh, it looks like we've got some some video there. Is that that's you with a koala, isn't it? Yeah, that's me with a little baby koala. Um, yeah, mm-hmm. we would spot them with the drones, with the spotlights, uh, and that's uh, amazingly enough. That's a spotlight on the on a drone in a burned out forest, yeah. and uh, you know I or others would climb up in the trees and grab the koalas, and then we would put them in more suitable habitat. If they were injured, we'd give them veterinary care. But um, that particular one I'm petting is a little baby uh, female koala that was uh, I spotted with the drone. And then we put a trap at the base of the tree because it was too small of a tree to climb. And uh, we captured it in the morning and then it was relocated to suitable habitat. But um, I'm sorry, what was your question again? It was pertaining yeah, to... I, I, well, I'm just wondering, uh, you know, how, how many of these animals were you able to rescue on that mission? Uh, probably 70 or something like that. Um, yeah, it was a ton of koalas, which, you know, without, without the drone, without the drones, I would imagine the rescuers might've gotten, you know, a quarter or a eighth of as many of those koalas, just cause the, the amount of land size and then the ability to see them. But with the infrared cameras on there, you know, for finding animals and for people, um, the drones are just uh, far superior, and they, there was a, um, there was a guy that tried to do it with a helicopter with the infrared equipment, and they thought they might have spotted like one koala, and that was about it. And they weren't able; it was just a big waste of money and time and, compared to. And why did why didn't it work with the helicopter? Uh, I don't think it was able to get down low enough, and then I think, um, you know, they the person that was trying to read it. Um, you know, wasn't, wasn't, uh, you know, it was like a regular person. It was not just a, it wasn't somebody that was trained in reading it. So that had an effect of course as well. And, and so you, you've done all of this, uh, of this work with koalas and a lot of work mm-hmm. with dogs. What other animals, I know some cats as well, but what other animals have you, have you rescued? Uh, dogs, cats, koalas, and I think that's it. Uh, I did a lot of population studies of what, anim- you know, documenting those little porcupine looking animals like echidnas in Australia, yeah. um, all sorts of different possums, um, animals, greater gliders, these basically like flying squirrels that are about the size of a house cat, the truly amazing animals. Um, so it was, those were population studies, but the rescues were primarily cats, dogs, and uh, koalas. So I, I think you know, it's really interesting to see what you're doing in that you're really pioneering a, a, a very important use case for drones. And, mm-hmm. you know, like drones are this, this incredibly transformative technology around so many different industries. Um, mm-hmm. and, and this is just a, a fantastic example because it's part of, it's part of disaster uh, management in a certain sense, right? Mm-hmm. Like it's, it's, it's sure. not, it's not bringing supplies to people that are in trouble, but it's part of this whole ecosystem of how are we going to deal with these, these large scale disasters? Um, what's the, what is the future for you and animal rescue look like? Are you planning on scaling your operations? Are you working with manufacturers to get, uh, you know, better lighting or better cameras for your drones? Like what's, what's the future of this application look like? 
Yeah, that I'm hoping um, in partnering up with you that we can put together something that's, um, you know, with adjustable lights, with better infrared cameras, with a payload capability to stay up in the air longer. And then, of course, you know, your drone would have no problem, actually, with a net or a carrier to put a dog or a koala and carry it back to safety. So, I mean, the speed at which animals could be rescued with your drone would be incredible. So let's, let's talk about that a little bit, just because I, I actually don't understand all the logistics involved. So the drone sure. would be flying, and let's just assume mm-hmm. it had a net, right? And it could actually mm-hmm. airlift an animal. And then you'd have a ground crew that would then help the animal into the net, and the drone would then bring them to some other location. Yeah. Yeah, what, what's, exactly. what do you guys do right now? Like right now, when you spot a koala, how do you actually get that animal rescued? Right now, when it's spotted, um, I'll mark the point, GPS points on the, yeah. you know, on the map, and then we'll go to it if it's further away uh, on foot or driving sometimes. Um, if it's close enough, like with hurricanes, with dogs and stuff, uh, I'll try to keep the drone up in the air, flying with the spotlight on it, and then have the rescue crews walk over to it and then capture it and then carry it back over. But Frequently, it's not easy carrying, you know, a wounded dog or something over the debris piles and stuff. So if it could be put into some sort of cage or something like that and then transported to safety, um, you know, it'd be ideal if they could, you know, transport right to the rescue tent, you know, a few miles down the road or something like that. Oh, that would be that would be a a wonderful application. Um, And I would think for humans, too, uh, it would for humans, it would be. you know, because I, I, how will what sort of payload um, can yours? I mean, I'm anticipating probably at some point you'll be able to pick humans up with it, right? Sure. So let me. I'm going to actually show the audience something here. And Doug, this is the uh, the first time anybody's seen this, so this will be <laughs> uh, this will be a surprise for you as well. Oh, cool. Um, so I'm going to share. Uh, actually, Sarah can share. Yeah, let's share a picture of Beta. So people have seen some of this, right? This is the, mm-hmm. the beta aircraft that we're building, but we've actually made a huge amount of progress over the past uh, couple months. So Sarah, why don't you show where we're at right now with this? There it is. Oh, wow. So there's, yeah. that is the beta aircraft. Uh, there's still work to be done before we're flying, but it's uh, well underway in terms of construction. And, um, this aircraft is going to carry a hundred pounds of payload and we're, you know, the current, the best current estimate on flight time is that we'll be able to, to lift that hundred pound payload for, for a little bit over two hours. The website oh, wow. still says one hour, just we haven't fully updated everything yet, but that's what our engine testing is showing us right now is that, is that we're actually going to have this two hours of flight time. And, um, in the future, to your point, uh, you know, every firefighter we've talked to, they always say, we want to be able to extract a firefighter or a civilian from harm's way. And sure. so, you know, we're really thinking that, uh, you know, we want to have a useful payload of 350 to 400 pounds, not just to extract a person, but also to be able to carry, you know, 50 gallons of water for spot fire suppression. So that's kind sure. of... The, the payload that we're targeting for the kind of the, the next, the next l- size up of, of this type of aircraft. Well, that's incredibly pr- impressive to say the least. Yeah. So um, anyway, that's, that's kind of the status there. Um, and I think, uh, you know, Australia is a super promising place to, to do some of those animal rescues. I also think mm-hmm. we could, you know, we're, we're working very closely with the uh, unmanned aviation group in Alaska, uh, we're mm-hmm. looking at doing a, a healthcare delivery, whether it's a vaccine or other healthcare goods that we're going to uh, do an unmanned delivery to a village up there as a demonstration mission. I, I oh, think wow. there's a lot of opportunity to do wildlife work in Alaska. Mm-hmm. And, I'm, and, and the reason Alaska is special is because they, they have a lot of latitude, uh, no pun intended, with the FAA <laughs> to um, uh, to to do things that you can't do in the, in the national airspace outside of Alaska. So for example, if we wanted to do something uh, beyond line of sight 
uh, with maybe some um, extended visual line of sight observers, or if we wanted to do something, you know, even just being over 55 pounds, like parallel flights drone is, mm -hmm. um, if we wanted to, you know, say, go do some wildlife work up there as a, as a demonstration mission at some point to test a, uh, a concept of operations, I think that there'd be a lot of uh, opportunity for that. Oh, well, that's, yeah, that's incredible. I know that in Australia, they were doing some, um, somebody was talking about and had started doing animal tracking with it. And that would be something that your drone would certainly be wonderful for was, um, you know, sometimes they were having limitations with mountains and stuff like that. But by yeah. popping the drone up in the sky, you could track and instead of being able to try triangulate and figure out where like one or two animals were with the drone, you could put it up in the sky and basically say, Hey, there's, you know, 45 uh, timber wolves in this particular area. And you could get a reading on where the whole family was. Right. And, and if, if you don't mind me asking who, who's funding the work that you're doing? Uh, the funding varied. Um, well, right now, right now, the bulk of the funding comes from the TV show that I host, um, that um, Curiosity Stream, the Doug to the Rescue show that's coming out. So that's not that hasn't been on the air yet. It's coming. It's no, coming. that comes out on Curiosity Stream in about probably three or four months. Um, okay. And then prior to that, some of the funding was uh, from World Wildlife Fund for about six or eight months, doing all okay. the koala studies. And then prior to that, uh, a bulk of it came from myself. Um, wow. So it was, um, you know, prior to COVID, I was doing a bunch of engineering and skyscraper work and stuff like that, where uh, real technical stuff and um, that paid really well. So I basically funded it myself. Um, wow. I got some money in the beginning for, from GoFundMe to help uh, fund some of the infrared equipment. And right. then some private donors, but um, yeah, so it's been a hodgepodge, a mix of a little bit of everything, basically. Well, it, 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 I mean, it, you really pioneered a fantastic application, and I hope that um, you know it continues to grow and develop, and that you know we can be part of it and bring our technology to the table. Um, yeah, that'd be we're, awesome. we're we already have customers lined up in Australia and are working with them for the the proper authorizations for our aircraft so i think there's a big opportunity to do something do some work together in australia and, and as i mentioned also alaska um the and, and and then beyond that i'm really excited to have you uh get behind the sticks on, on beta and yeah. do some flying because yeah that's, that, you know <laughs> it's, yeah. It's i literally the, really the, the yeah the, when is that that's coming up really quick right yeah, so the the plan, you know, that we're the timeline that we're following uh, is construction continuing through the end of December, and then what we call bring up starting in January. And for for our audience, uh, if you you know if you are a drone person, you'll understand, or if you've done any kind of you know technical or engineering work, when you have a new uh, system, there's always a lot of technical details that need to get ironed out and worked through as you're bringing that system up to fly. And, you know, I, we're anticipating about a month of bring up. So mm -hmm. really by the end of January, we're hoping we'll be in a place where we can have you come on out uh, and, and do some flying. And um, no. I know we started, we started putting, well, I actually, I probably, I don't know if I can mention it. So I'm, I'm going to zip my <laughs> lips. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, sorry about that. I don't want to cross lines there, but, um, you know, we're super excited to have you come fly. Yeah. And then, and then, you know, we're putting together um, op, uh, concept of operations and uh, basically not just demonstration missions, but uh, learning missions where we're, we're going to be getting some airspace in the, uh, in, in the demonstration forest, which is just mm -hmm. south of Santa Cruz. Mm -hmm. uh, Soquel area and mm -hmm. we're, we're getting that airspace so that we can go fly with CAL FIRE and do some exploratory operations and that would be a great opportunity for you to come fly with us as well 
Uh, yeah, that uh, that would be amazing to be doing, yeah. uh, putting out fires, doing fire suppression, whatever sort of firefighting. Um, that would be, yeah, that would be pretty much like a dream come true, obviously flying a drone like that, doing some sort of fire work. Well, we, yeah, so we're, we're super excited to have you there because of the relevant experience working in disaster situations. And, mm -hmm. you know, some of those first missions are going to be looking at unmanned logistics and what, what they call in the firefighting world, they call it tactical support. They don't like to mm -hmm. use the word logistics, right? Like logistics sure. is kind of everything that happens before, like getting stuff to the fire camp, but then mm -hmm. from, from base camp to the front line is all tactical. So sure. it's going to be doing that, um, that tactical support uh, will be some of the first stuff that we'll work on. And then obviously like, you know, figuring out how to incorporate some of the search and rescue lessons that you've learned into the sure. aircraft would make it just that much more useful for those applications. Oh, yeah. yeah, that would be incredible. I mean, because you're basically your drone has the ability to fly at night and through smoke and low elevation. I mean, what you have is just, um, yeah, I mean, it's a, huge, a monumental game changer for sure. Yeah, we're, we're super excited about it. So um, I think there's a lot of great ways that we can work together, um, yeah. you know, in the very near future. So I look forward to it. Um, yeah, me too. It would be great being able yeah. to work with you directly because some of the hardest parts have been with the drones has been like, you know, it's primarily the company in China building the drones. And of course, you can't get a hold of anybody to talk to and then like the spotlight is built by another company you can't get a hold of them and then with covid on top of it and firmware updates that don't work with this drone or that drone yeah it's been um it's and especially being the pioneer of the thing it's just like well you know what you know um uh, things weren't necessarily designed for you in my application so to work okay. with you directly and have you and your team the engineers you know hey tweak this a little or do this a little different it would be yeah that would be pretty damn sweet for someone like myself yeah well we really you know i we, we've i think closing that loop between the pilot and the engineering is going to be key to getting yeah. it right for the, the you know for the fire application and then search and rescue applications mm -hmm. which really a lot of people are are requesting uh that the mm -hmm. drone be outfitted for sar type work mm -hmm. um yeah. so do you have any, any, I mean, I've kind of asked you a bunch of questions. Did you have any questions for me that, that you were wondering about? And then I want to make sure we get, have time for Q and A for the audience. I, I definitely see some mm -hmm. things popping up on Q and A. Yeah, I guess uh, one of the things, um, what is it that you would see that would be the main difference between your drone and say some of the other ones that are out there? Well, I think the things that you, you talked about the, you know, the flight time and the mm -hmm. payload capability are, yeah really the big game changers we're so mm -hmm. we have I, I sarah i don't know if you have a picture of it but if you do it'd be great to share it with everybody we we just flew yesterday uh for the first well for the first time uh our our large scale mule and when i mm -hmm. what i what i mean by mule is it's a drone it's that has the same flight controller as mm -hmm. the the beta aircraft that we're building with the same programming on the flight controller, but it's just in a, a simple electric drone, but it's the same size. It's, it's a big mule. It's the same size as our, our beta. So we had a small mule that we flew a few weeks ago, and now we've, we've, we've uh, put together a large scale mule that we've been flying. And we flew that for the, for the first time uh, yesterday. Looks like Sarah's gonna be able to pull that up. Great, yeah. They're, do we have a picture of it actually flying? And we'll have to, we'll send that out later as an update for everybody, but we have a great, we have some great videos. Oh, there it goes. Okay, cool. Wow. This is, this isn't the best flight. We have a, you know, a much longer flight, but we have some great video of this thing tooling around uh, right in front of our shop. And, um, you know, this. So this is this is, one, the, yeah. all, is this one the hybrid one or is this, you said all electric? correct? No, this, this is all electric. So what it, what it allows okay. us to do is it, it simplifies the engineering so that we can simply focus on the flight controller. We don't okay. have to think about the rest of the propulsion system when we're sure. doing, the, doing the tuning. And then okay. we take that tuning from the mule and we bring it into the beta. And then we oh, okay. know we, we've kind of eliminated all the variable 
of the, the um, propulsion system so that we know that if there's an issue, it's only with propulsion, not with the actual flight controller or the tuning. Oh, okay. And you so, had mentioned <clears throat> yeah. once before, I think when we talked, you said something about how the lights, like when I was talking about how the lights, just the way the drones are all electric now, it just drains the battery down to nothing, no time flat. Yeah. But you said something that yours would have the ability to have a substantial amount of light power without draining its power when it's up in the sky. Yeah, we have, so it's one of the really unique capabilities of this uh, type of drone that we're building is mm -hmm. that it generates a tremendous amount of onboard power. So mm -hmm. we can literally power, I, I mean, probably even several kilowatts of spotlight. It would just wow. be un unbelievably bright compared to what anything yeah. that, that you're using right now. And it will have just a, a minimal effect on, on flight time. There's just That'd a lot great. of excess power available. So that's, that's certainly something that we're interested in doing. Uh, yeah, we have, we have other applications too, where people have sensors and stuff that use a lot of power that they want to, they want mm -hmm. our drone to power. Oh, great. So, um, and, but anyway, like you were asking about capability, like that mule as an all electric drone, it literally only flies for 10 minutes. You know, it's, okay. it's super limited. So we're, sure. we're, we're seeing, you know, when you get into these heavier lift uh, and larger aircraft, the battery limitations just become very, very serious. So the hybrid becomes a key component to making it stay up in the air much longer than. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Well, it's super great to um, get to share your, um, your experience with our audience. Uh, we, when we send up the follow-up email for all this, we'll include a bunch of links to some of the news stories that have been done around your work. Um, cool. You know, the, the application is fantastic. I want to open it up to, um, to give our, our audience a chance to ask some questions. All right. I'll start going through and thank you all for such great questions. This is great. Um, okay. So the first question is for Doug. Um, are you training others to use this type of equipment for animal rescue searches? Uh, that is my hope. That's um, one of the primary reasons I've been uh, agreed to do the TV show is to get other people inspired to do this. I think it's in its infancy right now because you know, there's not a bunch of people lining up to do it because most of the people that deal with drones at the moment um, have noticed a hit in their income with the COVID. So there are, you know, not too many people that I know that are skilled like myself are suddenly like jumping out to rescue animals or whatever because they're trying to rescue their own tail at the moment because COVID hit. Uh, the, you know, drone pilots pretty hard, obviously, with um, a lot of their income being slashed. But um, yeah, as soon as, you know, soon as things change around or whatever and certainly when people uh reach out to me the tricky part right now is just getting into you know because the equipment that i have is about probably around forty five fifty thousand dollars worth of equipment so it's not a cheap a cheap uh way to get into to suddenly start rescuing animals and then of course you have to have a pretty tremendous volume of experience to be flying a drone like that and especially at night and through trees and all that sort of stuff yeah. But yeah, I'm certainly open to um, training people um, as the as it progresses down to, when it gets to that point for sure. Great. And um, you sort of started to touch on this, but the next question um, was about again your animal rescue work. Um, do you need traditional flying clearances to fly in these areas with a drone, or do you have kind of free range? Um, and then how low are you gener generally having to fly the drones for animal rescue? Um, yeah, it just depends on the situation, what sort of clearance you need with the FAA, um, and it varies from country to country. Um, what I will typically fly on average depends on the animals, but generally pretty low. I'm generally within about 75 feet above ground level, um, just to get really good heat signatures off the animals. Sometimes I'll pop the drone up high. Um, and go a few hundred feet to get a general sense of, um, you know, if I can spot any heat signatures of koalas from afar. Uh, but I'll generally, as I'm actually looking, I'm probably about 75 feet above the ground. Great, thank you. <laughs> um, 
we had a question about your TV show, um, and I know it was going to be coming to Curiosity Stream soon. Maybe you yeah. have um, some links that you can share just so that we can send it out with an email, or do you have any additional info about your TV show? Yeah, um, we've been filming it for about the past year. Um, it's been somewhat challenging because with the COVID and stuff, you know, there'll be different disasters um, that it's just like, dang, I wish we could film there. And then uh, we just can't get active. Like I think in Beirut when they had a like, big explosion and people were trapped in animals, I was just like, God, I wish I could get there. And then Philippines had a bunch of flooding recently and I was hoping to get there, but um, yeah, it's been a little bit of a challenge. So we've been more focused in the United States. Um, but the show should be out in about three or four months. Uh, it's being put out by Curiosity Stream, and um, yeah, I can certainly share more info as it um, gets closer along. Excellent. They're waiting. They're waiting to have all the episodes filmed before it um, comes out. So we have two more episodes. I think we're supposed to shoot, and then uh, it'll supposedly come out after that. Great. Mm -hmm. Okay, Joshua, we have some questions for you about the drone. Um, so the first question is, is the new drone solar powered? No, <laughs> the, it is not solar powered. Uh, it's, it is power, it is a hybrid drone. So it's gas electric and uh, it, it has enough onboard energy for over two hours of flight time with full payload. Great. And then back to the payload, um, another question about that uh, relating to payload with fuel. So, so payload ex obviously ex excludes the fuel. So he's asking if that's 100 pounds for two hours with about 15 pounds of fuel. So can you just give some clarity about the payload when fuel gets involved? Yeah, the, the payload is useful payload, so that doesn't include fuel. And we, we carry about 6.6 .6 gallons of fuel. So I think that comes out to around 35 pounds. Great. Um, next question about the beta aircraft. I'll keep these looped together as much as I can. Um, what sort of autonomy are you building into the drone? Will it have to return to base remembering how high it needs to fly to do terrain and obstacle avoidance on the way back to a point and so on? Great question. So. The autonomy is pretty much everything that comes available with the flight controller, which is a very high end flight controller. And so it has the terrain following built in auto takeoff, auto land. Uh, it, it'll follow a predefined GPS map. Uh, it, it does not do any autonomous obstacle avoidance. So that has to, you know, there, there's the, a remote pilot in command is, is going to be watching the video feed the whole time. And if, you know, we're seeing something that wasn't called out on the map, say there's a radio tower that wasn't shown on the map, you know, we would see those lights and say, okay, we gotta, we gotta change the, um, the waypoints here to fly around it. Okay. Um, and then last question, I think for now about beta, um, do all four IC engines have capabilities to support electrical power generation? Yes, they do. That's a great question. Yeah, it's one of the unique features. So it, it's really interesting in that, you know, if we have a particular engine that fails, the other three engines then can provide power to, that, to the e-motor on the failed engine and you can keep running. So there's this built-in redundancy it, that's, that's built into the architecture. All right, Douglas, we'll take it back to you. Um, I think you might've touched on this a little bit before, but just to go in a little deeper. So, um, we're getting a question about if you've done any work for animal conservation research or has it all been focused on disaster help? Um, she says, I can see this technology being amazing for ecological studies. Uh, well, it did, <clears throat> after the fires in, in uh, Australia, I uh, spent about, I think it was about five months working for World Wildlife Fund doing population studies on the animals. And it was primarily koalas, but basically I was giving them data on whatever animals I found. And it was also, um, a lot of it was finding out what the capabilities were of the drone, like what kind of animals we could find and how, how successful it was and, uh, you know, trial and error, seeing uh, which equipment worked, what didn't work. So, um, yeah, I was able to find all different types of gliders, possums, echidnas, koalas, and then, um, you know, 
give the data give the data back to them and let them know where the animals are still remaining after the fires and then um World Wildlife Fund was going to continue to do those studies after I had left Australia. Um, so I'll hopefully get back there and be able to do some more work with them. Um, the next question is a little bit more focused on the technology that you're using right now, Douglas. So uh, okay. do the drones have a camera that moves and is operated or are the cameras built in? So specifically, if you're trying to get a view of a koala, that is to the left of the drone. Are you physically turning the drone or are you just panning? The no, the camera moon moves all around just like on a, you know, a, a lot of people will be familiar with like a Phantom or a Mavic drone. It's similar uh, to that where you can tilt and pan and move all over. Um, the, the challenging part with the drone that I have right now is that it, you can either have the the infrared camera and the spotlight or the infrared and the really good zoom lens, but you can't have all three at once. Um, so that's what I'm hopeful, you know, with the drone that you all are building, you know, you'll have the capability to have all sorts of cameras and much better optical because you'll be able to not have, you know, you'll be able to put much bigger glass on the cameras and stuff yep. like that. So the infrared will be much more successful as will the zoom camera with whatever sort of spotlight. So I, I'll be able to have all three at once instead where right now I'm trying to at night use the, I have to have the spotlight and then switching to whatever camera zoom lens is on the built into the infrared camera. And it's really not that good because it's, it, is digital and then it just pixelates real quick so it's challenging to see what the results are um, at night frequently okay right. yeah and so along with that what kind of what kind of payload are we talking about there with all the technology oh uh, with what what the with the, the matrice two, mm -hmm. yeah the matrice 210 that i have i mean it can carry maybe a couple pounds or something like that it's not very much i mean you could probably tie you know it would probably have the ability to tie do a little bit more but yeah i mean what your drone can do and what mine can do um yours pretty much is like a pinto up against a lamborghini or something mine mine being the pinto of course so yeah mine gets smoked out of the water by yours so i i, um, I uh I, I saw some of those larger optical packages. I mean, they can weigh like five or 10 pounds. They're like, you know, these large oh, spher wow. spherical yeah. systems with, you know, it's one of, it's, it's interesting. Cause like I was talking to the, you know, I, I was, it was when trade shows were still a thing and you could get on a plane and go to oh, a trade yeah. show and like shake people's hands and trade business yeah. cards. Remember that? <laughs> Way um, back when. Yeah. yeah. So it was during one of those things. And I was talking with one of these guys and he had these huge optical packages. And I said like, why why are these so big like can't they be made smaller he's like well you can't you can't shrink optics because of the the physics of the no. size of the the lens is it, yeah. you you only can get so much light in that's why like if you if you look at those huge telescopes uh you know on mount palomar stuff like that like why do yeah. they need to build such a big telescope well the answer is that you make this huge opening and all the light can come you, you collect more photons so oh, it's a yep. physical limitation. And so some of these bigger optical packages, just, they're, they're just bigger. And so they yeah. weigh more and they have to have more isolation from the mm -hmm. aircraft and so on. So anyway, I, I'm really looking forward to being able to put, you know, bigger, more powerful uh, infrared zoom onto the Yeah, aircraft. that'll be a huge yeah. game changer because it'll also be, um, you know, because one of the things right now, like if, if I could just hand my drone to somebody and magically they could fly it really good, it's still really challenging even reading what you're seeing with it. It's not like you see a koala and it looks perfectly like a koala and stuff like that with the, with the mm -hmm. infrared cameras that we have and stuff like that um, because of the payload limitations, you know, they're, they're okay, but they're not like something where, it, um, you know, the footage that I give to the media and stuff, that's always in the most ideal, perfect situation. The ground is freezing cold and there's a koala bear here and it's, you know, everything's just right so that the media can be like, oh, okay, wow, it looks like a koala or something like that, but it doesn't typically, it's not that simple. you have got um, hot spots and hot readings all over and it's just mm. shape of it. Yeah, it's just not... Um, with the quality of the technology um, because of the weight limitations and uh, right. battery. Um, 
what you'll be able to do with your drone will be far superior than what's out there right now. I look forward to it. Yeah, me too. <laughs> all right, I think we have time for just one more question. Um, and again, thank you all for submitting so many great questions. We will answer anything that we don't get to live on the webinar via email. We share the recording. So stay tuned for that. Everybody who registered will get an email and we'll be answering these remaining questions. Um, so the last question is related to um, transporting our drone, the parallel flight drone. So how do we plan to overcome challenges of transporting um, parallel flights drone to an animal rescue site? Um, so, you know, obviously with the large scale drone and the increased payload, um, that creates new challenges um, as opposed mm -hmm. to a smaller drone. So how do we, we might be able to overcome that? Sure. Yeah. I mean, it's everything is a trade off. You know, there's, there's, if you're coming in with a smaller aircraft, you know, you, you can physically carry it to uh, a location a little bit more easily. Um, but in our case, you know, our drone fairly easily fits in the back of a pickup truck or on a small trailer behind a pickup truck. Um, two people can lift it off the trailer and put it on the ground. So um, it's, it's not a, it's not a tremendous burden, but yeah, it does, you know, requires a little bit more open space to take off from than a, a super small drone. So yeah, definitely a trade-off, but one that can be pretty much overcome with a pickup truck. <laughs> all right. Well, um, thank you all for joining Joshua. I'll let you wrap it up. Great. Well, I want to thank you, Doug, for taking the time to join this call uh, with mm -hmm. our investors and potential investors. Um, mm -hmm. It's very much appreciated, and, and the work that you're doing is appreciated as well by uh, the animals that you're rescuing, and uh, in some cases, their owners as well. So that's mm -hmm. wonderful. So thanks for being with us. Yeah, um, thanks for having me. I definitely... Um, yeah, I look forward to working with you all. It's um, yeah, when I when I, the first morning uh, before we met, I couldn't sleep at night or whatever. I was so excited to, <laughs> to the possibilities. So yeah, it's um, yeah, it's like that's to be able to fly this drone and work with you all and uh, get it going and uh, use it would be yeah, pretty much a, a definite dream come true. This is a incredible drone that you're putting together. Well, we're we're looking forward to that as well, and also. For our investors, we are, our, our Regulation A campaign is going swimmingly. It's going really well. Um, you know, it's been open for about two and a half months and we are just inches away from a million dollars, which is fantastic. And uh, we have so many exciting announcements and um, developments on the technology side that we're gonna be starting to release. You know, you all saw it here first. You saw the beta, uh, you know, on the, the, we, we literally haven't shown it outside of this webinar. So you guys got the first crack at it. Um, but we're going to start releasing some of that um, over the next, you know, two months. And uh, we're sure that that's going to continue pr to propel um, this round to and really take it to the next level. So thank you, everybody. And Sarah, if you don't mind, just throw the uh, investment link into the uh, to the chat for everyone. And I just wanna thank our audience for their participation today. I, I know everybody is suffering from some degree of Zoom fatigue or another. So thank you everybody for taking the time to do this. And uh, I, I wish everybody a wonderful uh, afternoon. Mm -hmm. Thank you.